Thank you for choosing OECD Podcast. Welcome to OECD Podcast. I'm Clara Young, and I'm in La Paranta in Finland having breakfast with Jamie Heinemann, who was the co-host of the science show Mythbusters, the show that was on the Discovery Channel for many, many years. And the hosts, Jamie Heinemann and Adam Savage, what they did was tested urban legends using science and engineering. So I ran into Jamie yesterday at a prototype laboratory at the La Paranta University of Technology. So my first question to you, because for our listeners who might not know what that is, what is a prototype laboratory or a fab lab? Well, uh, there have been a number of them. The Fab Lab was created by MIT and is one of the best known ones. Uh, there was also Tech Shop in the United States, which was a commercialized version of it that was successful. These are places that are kind of the modern equivalent of what we used to have as shop class, except of course now uh, uh, they're like a Fab Lab in particular is something that you almost need to be a grad student in mechanical engineering mm -hmm. to use and you have to learn programming and all sorts of other things to use what's in there. Uh, tech shop was something that was not associated with schools but it was available to communities and you had a membership. Uh, they went out of business unfortunately after about a decade. but You're um, talking about the MIT? No, the tech shops. Oh, the tech shops. And uh, they were mainly in the United States, but there were some in France and in Asia as well. What they provide is a way of having hands-on experience with technology. Right. And technology can be digital technology and so on, of course, which in their case often went to things like you know, 3D printers and CNC programming. but. Uh, the reality and one of the reasons that I'm a big advocate of them is that uh, tech goes all sorts of places to uh, different materials and processes where you can have a familiarity with, let's say, sewing things. In the same place you can go from sewing something to welding or machining something or, uh, I mean, they, 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 if they're any good, those kinds of uh, rapid prototyping labs give you the ability to make anything that you can dream up. The Jamie Heinemann Center, it's quite unusual because it has not only a, you know, a sewing machine and welding machine and all that, but it also has very big machineries like, like uh, extruders, which is quite unusual. Uh, yes and no. Uh, clarify a bit. What's interesting about the setup here, and as far as I'm aware is unique, is that the JHC or Jamie Heinemann Center everybody should have a building uh, with their name on it, uh, <laughs> is kind of sort of based on um, M5, my shop in San Francisco, where Mythbusters was shot. So there's a lot of uh, basic stuff, the, you know, lathes and milling machines and drills and saws and, and stuff that you can, you know, you can do carpentry with or you can machine metal with and things like that. that and and it, so it covers that broad spectrum from metals and woods and things to sewing fabrics or, or doing other things. But outside of the JHC is a facility that is enormous and has very expensive, very specialized equipment, very advanced equipment, you know, gigantic machines for testing material strengths and uh, for testing things that they might want to extrude, like reinforced plastics. One of the projects that I saw in there, they're experimenting with recycling plastic bottles and things like that and reinforcing fibers to them to use them for other purposes. And so what that means is that a student going into the JHC who shows promise might well find that as a conduit to get into these other facilities that are right there that are partnering with industry at large in uh, doing R&D to develop new and uh, innovative products. And, uh, and this is also a conduit, of course, uh, for those students to find jobs and careers in those areas. The JHC is very accessible to anybody. Any beginning student that comes in can get uh, you know, shown the safety and you know, basic tool operation. And if they have an idea, they can make the thing. But then this is also this career path into a much, much larger world uh, that that um, I uh, was surprised to see uh, when I came here. I thought it was just a rapid prototyping center, but uh, that puts it into a, a much larger picture that's very important. 
We were also talking yesterday about giving students access to the tools and also to all this machinery. They gain a practical knowledge of how to build and how to design that a lot of engineering students might not have who are much heavier on theory. Don't know if you could go yeah, into that. Uh, uh, that's an excellent point and it's not to be underestimated. It's one thing to be hands-on and so on, but you can go to a lot of universities and get a mechanical engineering degree and not know how to do a damn thing other than sit at a, a, a CAD program in a, in a computer. And you may well be able to design things and have them manufactured as a result of that engineering degree. And you might be able to do a fairly good job at it, but compare that to somebody that has practical experience where they've, you know, broken things and they've tried something and failed and they've seen what they can get away with and what they can't. They've seen how these tools work and how the materials that they work with work and this gives them a way of internalizing all of these things so that when they do get into a situation where they're uh, engineering something using advanced technologies they know right from the top to the bottom what they're doing and can do a much much better job it uh, will allow them to do things like innovate and create new things instead of just sit there and use the tool. Right, so it, it makes easier the path from ideas, ideas in your head, to innovations. And also in a practical sense, it helps bridge that gap that so many students or young people face of leaving university and finding a job. And that's some, there's a lot of thinking going on about that right now. At, government level businesses well yeah schools. And, and the thing is that you know this is n not necessarily something new I mean historically before we had universities and things I would assume we had apprenticeships for various crafts or skills and you could look at that as something like yeah this is a training thing that helps them learn a particular craft but as I described it's more than that these kinds of hands-on experiences over a broad range, build a foundation of knowledge that is much different than something specialized like an apprenticeship does. And what that does is it allows a person to understand and deal with things that they have no direct experience with. Uh, so they're able to make intuitive leaps about a thing because of the breadth of their hands-on experience. So if you're specialized, which is often what a university will do for you, is specialize your education in something like mechanical engineering, you may well have a certain ability within a, a, a linear direction to do something that they've decided or you've decided that you want to know how to do. But what happens when there's something that you haven't been taught about? Uh, what, what, if it's not within that linear direction, what are you going to do? That's part of the whole ethos of this laboratory, which is go there, experiment, kind of play, right? Exactly. That broadens. It, it's what children do when they're learning. Yeah. And just because we're adults and we've got all this complicated crap that we have to learn doesn't mean that our minds don't want to work the same way. What a child does by doing all this random stuff when they play is this, they're assembling a broad foundation of knowledge about how the, the world works. And then if they've done a good job of that, when there's something that reality throws at them, which it's gonna, uh, they have recourse to make those intuitive leaps. So this is a kind of a, a higher learning version of that that will allow them to innovate and do things other than recite what they've been taught in their class. Doctor. Jamie Heineman, I'm going to finish this conversation with a question about your own projects. Well, it took me a couple of years to clean up the mess that they left in my shop, uh, but uh, that's all all been done. I looked at it like, uh, you know, like joining a gym. I lost a few pounds and, and got everything back in the proper boxes, and now I'm using that facility for R&D myself. I'm doing stuff primarily for safety purposes. Uh, I am working for the military some, but uh, there are these are things to keep soldiers safe. One of the favorite projects that I've had, and, 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 and I'm enjoying this now because uh, uh, these are like year-long or more projects that I've taken on as opposed to 
having to do stuff on television that I had to turn around in a couple of weeks. So I'm able to uh, sink my teeth into things. And for me, that means, uh, you know, go into the shop, lock the door, crank the music, and come out with a thing a year later, uh, as it were. And uh, the favorite project that I have now that it has just delivered is a, a firefighting vehicle that's made to deal with some of these big fires that are starting because of global warming, mm -hmm. uh, in particular in California uh, here now in 2018. We've had uh, a number of enormous fires that are unprecedented. And so uh, they're doing things that the firefighting industry has not doesn't have any answers for. They try to do damage control and that's about all they can. But uh, this device that I built is basically a converted uh, armored personnel carrier that is no longer armored uh, and it has the ability because of what modifications I've put on it to go into a fire. So if somebody has not been evacuated mm -hmm. that was in front of the path of a fire uh, instead of not being able to risk firefighters' lives to get them, we can send this thing in. It can exist in a fire for as long as it takes, get them out of there. We may even be able to protect neighborhoods that are in the path of the fire in the first place. And eventually, if we have enough of these things, we might even be able to create what I refer to as a mobile fire break, which means that we would put these things in front of the fire and they would uh, take the energy of a fire uh, down over time, uh, you know, I kind of like catching a big fish with light tackle. You don't want to do it all at once or you're going to lose. So this is, a, this is a whole thing that didn't exist before and we're about to send it into a fire. I, I have high hopes for it. Well, I'm sure the city is uh, eager to put that into use given everything that's going on. So, well, thank you very much, Jamie, for your time. And thank you for listening to OECD Podcasts. Well, thank you. And thanks for having OECD. It sounds like a noble enterprise. We try to be. Thank you. Thank you.